One of the latest kids on the political block being the Independent Patriots for Change, abbreviated IPC, led by erstwhile independent presidential candidate Dr. Panduleni Itula, recently unsuccessfully took the Electoral Commission to court. Deputy Judge President Jose Angula and Judges Anneli Prinslow and Thomas Masuku were of the view that the Electoral Court was not the right avenue to hear the application. IPC wanted the court to instruct the Electoral Commission of Namibia to disclose the contents of a legal opinion that the electoral body had sought from the Attorney General on the dual candidacy. The IPC is of the view that dual candidacy, which is in, the, in this regard, running for both State House and the National Assembly, goes against the doctrine of separation of powers. The three judges bench agreed with the ECN that they did not have jurisdiction to hear the matter. In this episode of the Wheels of Justice, we'll make it our mission to delve into the underpinnings of the said judgment against the backdrop of dual candidacy. Greetings, Namibia. My name is Daniel Nadunya, and I'll be your host for the Wheels of Justice. This evening, we'll be back shortly. Welcome back, and this session is officially underway. Joining us for this engagement are advocate Eliasa Nekwaya, a member of the Society of Advocates of Namibia, and Mr. Tukonjenina Napo, that's the director at Tina Napo Incorporated. Gentlemen, a good evening to you, and welcome to the Wheels of Justice. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having us. Yes, it, it's also uh, customarily here on the Wheels of Justice that uh, mm -hmm. we accord an opportunity for those making their first appearance on our bench to <laughs> present or to basically say out their maiden statement. Um, in, in so doing, if there is any preliminary point that you would want us to address from the onset, please you are welcome. Let's start with you, Advocate. Um, luckily not, uh, no preliminary issues for me, so we can delve into issues. Thank you so much. Yeah. Any point in limine? Thank you, Daniel. Yes. So there's nothing at the moment, uh, but we are ready to go into the issues. Yes. yes. In setting the scene, p perhaps and the stage, I would want us to have regard to perhaps a distinction between what would be motion proceeding and action proceeding. Uh, yes, if I can, I can deal with that quickly. Um, and the motion proceeding and the action proceeding is really one would distinguish them. Uh, when you come to court um, seeking for any relief, uh, there are two vehicles one uses in which you can uh, bring your case for adjudication before the courts. And when you talk about action proceeding and motion proceeding, those are the two vehicles one utilizes. The action proceedings is a motion, it's a proceedings that are commenced by summons, um, which is supported by what you call particulars of claim, which is really your statement of claim. Mm -hmm. And the, your application proceedings is the matter which is brought by way of a, a, a notice of motion, which is a notice asking the court, this is what I want, and is supported by a founding affidavit. Right. Uh, the distinctions lie in utilizing the two vehicles. It lies in the, um, whether you, the, you foresee any factual dispute that would arise. The other one, the, the, the action proceeding is determined by way of oral evidence. Um, the application proceedings, the court do simply look at the papers and decide that case on the papers as they stand. So yes. that's the basic really difference. But right. I can explain more and more. Yes, but, in, yeah. in the matter between mm -hmm. IPC and uh, the Electoral Commission of, of Namibia, which, which vehicle did they use, uh, Mr. Nanapo? No, they have used an application proceeding. Right. Yes, where they brought their, their case on paper. Right. Yes. Now... Uh, maybe c c kindly walk us through the salient facts of the matter uh, in the Independent Patriots for Change versus the ECN. Um, yes, the, the salient fact is simply, they are quite very I could, short. Yes. Um, um, a consultation meeting happened between the political parties and the Electoral Commission of Namibia, the ECN. 
Um, the ECN, the one political party, the Independent of Candidate for Change, um, did raise an issue of what they call um, uh, dual candidacy of uh, members contesting to uh, political offices. Um, and the Electoral Commission then decided um, uh, that it's a, this is quite a complex issue. We would then um, uh, seek for a legal opinion from the Attorney General who is the principal liberal advisor to the government and the president in terms of the constitution. Yes. Um, they obtained the legal advice from the attorney general in the form of a legal opinion. Um, and it is on the basis of that opinion that the political party asked that it must be disclosed to them or the Inde independent party for change, IPC wants that uh, to be disclosed to them. Um, and the ECN then declined the disclosure, um, say, citing, of course, the confidentiality, but in, in, when you, in effect, it's attorney-client privilege. Right. Uh, they then they challenged that decision to court in the um, electoral court. Um, those, and then the electoral court then made a decision for which we'll come back to it later yes. in yes. the show. Perhaps that, that's <clears throat> what we also need to have regard to Mr. Nanapo. Yes. Um, look, if... A consultation took place as, yes. as elaborated by mm. our Leonard friend here. Now, from which consultation emanated the legal opinion being sought by the Electoral uh, Commission of Namibia? Yes. What is the basis, perhaps, uh, of course, we understand uh, the privilege being raised there, but, but what is the basis for perhaps uh, IPC's uh, application mm -hmm. versus the, the respondent's uh, 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 argument, perhaps? Yes. Uh, what the IPC is seeking is that the ECN should disclose the legal opinion that was sought. And uh, they are saying that uh, that opinion was obtained as a result of the uh, stakeholders meeting that took place. Yes. And uh, the fact that it took, it took place yes. and uh, they saw that op opinion on their request, now they want that opinion to, to be disclosed. Yes. However, the ESEN is of a view that they cannot disclose it because it's attorney client privileged that means is confidential yes but but, but I, I would understand their argument to to say look how do you all of a sudden want to say it's it's confidential where in the first place we raised the issue we raised the question uh, you wouldn't have sought an opinion in the first place if we did not raise this now just after we raised it you come and say uh, look, it's, it's, it's confidential. Where are we in the picture? Yeah, look, what basically happened is that uh, firstly, Isian sought the views of the uh, IPC and say, what are your views on dual candidacy, right? And then now, the after, uh, thereafter on that particular view, ECN now went to seek an opinion, so a legal opinion. Is that so? My, my understanding is... ECN had a consultation with all stakeholders being political, registered political parties. And during that specific consultation, then IPC raised the issue of dual candidacy. Yes. Is, is that so? Yes. Meaning IPC initiated this very specific issue or this very legal question. Yes for which ECN, in the absence of uh, perhaps capacity to, to make a determination on its own or to answer to that, sought then an opinion. Yes. Yes. I yes. Mean, I mean, what uh, IC did first yes. is that, okay, you know, IPC, uh, uh, please give us your view yes. on dual candidacy. Uh, right. And then thereafter, after having considered that view, Yes. And then ECN now sought for the legal of opinion. Yes. So we do not know what the content is. Yes. But upon receiving it, they say uh, this opinion is, 
is actually privileged. Okay. On, on, on that particular basis, we cannot uh, disclose it to right. you. Yes. Perhaps uh, let's really explain this concept of attorney-client privilege. What, what does it really entail? Um, yes, well, is, is, is it an instrument uh, to, to basically conceal some kind of information? No, no, no. It's, a, it's, it's quite a very uh, important principle in our law. Right. Um, which seeks to protect the inf uh, communications between um, you, the lawyer and their client. Yes. Um, you can just imagine um, if that is not protected in this day and age, anybody can go to court and ask what mm -hmm. did the attorney advise their client on. So as your opponent, but it's quite a very constitutional principle of ours. Um, it, it's quite entrenched in our common law. Uh, and it's quite very important for the um, protection of that information and communicate free flow of communication and advice between the lawyers and um, their clients. Um, it, 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 uh, it, it, that's really the, the basic I explanation of what, what attorney on, on client privilege are is. There, are there exceptions, uh, perhaps? Uh, yeah, there are exceptions to yes. the attorney client privilege. For example, the client can always waive. The client can know he says, what, that's a legal opinion that you, uh, you have rendered to me. Um, I'm prepared that it must be disclosed to a newspaper or to NBC TV or radio. But um, that, that's up to a, the that, client. It's a client. The, the In this is case, that, ECN. ECN. The privilege of that is that of the client. The, there is nothing wrong for ECN to, um, to waive it if they want to. But the privilege is that of, of, of the electoral commission. Um, in respect of the communication between them and their principal legal advisor, who is the Attorney General. Yes. M Mr. Nanapo, perhaps what is your Leonard view when it comes to a matter of public interest versus that privilege that still needs to be respected? A matter of public interest is a matter that affects the general public. However, um, even that, as it may, Yes. Uh, obviously, if you look at ECN being the public body, and, and also if you have to look at the attorney client privilege, uh, you know, uh, so it could be that by not disclosing that particular legal opinion, it's of public interest. It's right. just that we don't know it. Right. Yes. Uh, but <laughs> let's then have regard to what perhaps the legal question that the court needed to determine. In this case, we know that the matter was not had on merit yes. or on, its, its, on facts, um, being that the court found that they did not have jurisdiction as argued by ECN, but had it been had on merits or on facts, what was the question, a legal question that the court had to determine or needed to determine? Well, uh, it was the question of, of the dual candidacy. Yes. Um, in the sense that uh, IPC came to court and say, uh, we want clarity, N not to court, basically. So when, when, when the opinion was actually sought by, by ECN, they want the clarity on, on the dual ca candidacy. Now, when, when, when IPC came uh, to court, they say, uh, please, we want to know what is the dual candidacy in this particular case. Can one stand for uh, a presidential election and also the parliament at the same time? But then uh, that uh, uh, question was not in, in entertained because of the point eliminated that was raised. Mm. Yes. What would, perhaps in your Leonard uh, op opinion, if, if if this application was not uh, struck of the court role on, on, on account of uh, jurisdiction. Uh, what do you think would have informed the court's decision? On, 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 on the matter itself of yeah, dual, dual... Luckily, the court what was would not you asked, think? Um, luckily, the court was not asked to determine whether you are, it's, permissible, it's permissible to have dual... Um, what you call dual candidacy. Yes. Um, it, it was really confined whether the court, the ECN is entitled to, to refuse disclose. to disclose a legal yes. opinion. The issue of a dual candidacy, it's, it's another issue that should, rise, should arise at some stage yes. when it's ripe to, for determination. I'm not too sure 
whether at this stage it's ripe because um, it, it matters will become ripe not by way of seeking legal advice yes. from the court. It become ripe when there is a, 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 a dispute between the parties, yes. i.e. there will be a dispute between the ECN and another person. Let's say, yes. for example, um, a presidential candidate, because the way I understand it, the contention is that you can be a member of a presidential candidate running for presidency office at the same time, you are also in the list of members of people who are um, running to become members of the National Assembly. Yes. Um, that issue would only arise or become ripe for determination if um, IPC at that stage, let's say, for example, the nomination has been received, the nomination has been registered, and then you are saying, please remove, um, I want you to declare that Elias Ernequa is not entitled to contest for the position of the National Assembly because he is a presidential candidate. Mm -hmm. Um, and for that, you would probably seek a declaration that the, the, our electoral system, by way of an electoral act, does not permit a such. Mm -hmm. Then the court would then have to determine such an issue. So, so it would to become then ripe then because the court have to determine a live issue as between the parties, yes. as between um, the ECN uh, registering or accepting a nomination of yes. somebody yes. who is not supposed to be nominated yes. on the version of the IPC. Yes and the person who is nominated as a candidate and also is against the uh, 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 IPC. Yes. So that then there is a live issue. At the moment, I'm not too sure there is, there is a live issue as between the party other than an academic question whether it's possible and for which one would, it seems to me, seeking for legal advice from yes. either EC and, and that of it, the court. Yes. Basically what you're saying is that uh, at the moment it's premature. It, but, but, that's but, how I but see it. But it's yeah. probably a question that would still find its way back uh, to the courts um, if, if that dispute arises. Yes, indeed. I indeed. indeed. Uh, uh, which will be the right then uh, jurisdiction for, for that matter to be heard, Mr. Nanapo? Uh, if one has to look at the Electoral Act, uh, it actually uh, stipulates that so there's an Electoral Tribunal and the Electoral Court. So it says that uh, all the um, electoral issues and processes should start at the Election Tribunal. Mm. Uh, I mean, if that, if, if any party, uh, they use a word, I think is a complaint. Yes. If they have any complaint of electoral nature, they must go to the uh, electoral tribunal. That, that yeah. would be the right platform. Yeah, yeah yes. at that stage, yes. of course, it would be the right platform. Yes. Right. Mm. There will be no question about the jurisdiction issue. But the distinction with the current match is simply that um, here you are asking the court to review and set aside a decision to refuse you to get access to a legal opinion. Yes. But when you are, you are contesting a candidate who is nominated because you are objecting, you have got a complaint about the nomination of a candidate in both list, either presidential or, or national assembly mm. list, there, of course, um, if, if, it's pre if you raise that issue before the elections, of course, it, it, it's a tribunal issue yes. for which you can appeal to electoral um, um, uh, court. Uh, that would possibly uh, initially fall within the, the realm of both bodies, either electoral court or electoral tribunal, and that you can actually review and set aside that decision at that stage. Mm. Um, but the question of, uh, the, of, of the legality of a decision of the ECN to refuse to give you a legal opinion is simply a civil, straightforward ad legality issue. Yes, we, which uh, then could have been the right uh, avenue? That should be a high court. Right. which have got the inherent reservoir of uh, um, inherent jurisdictions to determine all those constitutional issues at court of instance. Right. Well, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. You are following the wheels of justice here on NBC. And uh, tonight we are having regard to a court judgment uh, in a matter between IPC and the Electoral Commission of Namibia. We'll be back to open our telephone lines. So stay tuned. Welcome back, Namibia. Uh, in this episode of the Wheels of Justice, we endeavor to dissect a recent electoral court judgment. Should you want to ask a question or contribute, the telephone line is 291-3339. That is 291-3339. I kindly remind you to be brief, concise, and respectful at all time. Your calls are now welcome. Perhaps, uh, let's continue. W what was the ratio decidante of 
the judgment of the court. What, of course, I know we've already uh, dealt with the issue of jurisdiction, but, mm. but I mean, there should be reasoning behind. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, the rational decision that we really, in, in simple terms, simply were the reasons for the decision of the court. Yes. Um, and in this case, the court simply look at the provisions of the Electoral Act um, and, and look at whether what, in relation to the relief, meaning the, the, the order that the ECN, I mean the EP, IPC sought from the court, uh, falls within the categories of the orders or the functions or the powers of the um, electoral court. Yes. Um, and the court found that uh, the electoral court says you can review and set aside, that's what the X says, review and set aside the decisions of the electoral com commission um, in relation to any electoral matter. Um, and the court says what you are actually looking at your pleadings, so your papers as they stand, you are not raising an e electoral issue, either pre-elections um, or post-elections issue relating to the elections or electoral issues. Mm. Pre-election issues is like objections to nomination of political parties or members um, or objections relating to a voter's role. Any matter that arise arises immediately, immediately before, before the, election. the election. Yes. And then the court says it's on that basis that the issue that you're seeking is simply a, a review against the decision of the electoral commission, which falls un under the jurisdiction of the high court and they have nothing to do with any electoral mm. issues. Yes. Yeah. And, and Mr. Nanapo, yes. surely the court relied on uh, uh, decided cases for guidelines or for guidance, uh, please maybe highlight even one or two of those uh, uh, yes. decisions. Yes, yes. Um, uh, on the on the point of jurisdiction, uh, I saw the court uh, have relied on another matter that says that uh, if if there is a point in limine that has to do with the power of, of the court to hear the matter, they have to decide that first. And right. they, they cannot even go, go further before they decide if they have the power to hear that particular matter. And the point in limine, there was the issue of jurisdiction. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Right. Yes. And, and also, secondly, is that um, uh, on, the, on the interpretation of the pleadings on the, on the, on the affidavits as they are, uh, there's no electoral issue as contemplated by the Act. So on that particular uh, basis, so the court say, uh, we're not going to hear you because we as the electoral court cannot hear that particular matter because it doesn't fall within the ambit of the electoral act. I think it's section 163, if I remember very well. Mm. Yes. And any, any addition to, to... No, no, I've, that's basically what the court has uh, decided. 061-291. Three 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 nine. That is our telephone line uh, in the studio. Zero six one two nine one triple three nine. Please. The right time is now for you to ask your question or contribute towards the topic. Um, the electoral court hel held that the refusal by the ECN to share the legal opinion, which the IPC sought to be made available to it was not an electoral issue. I still want us to perhaps delve in that. Can we clearly say it's not an electoral issue? Because the, the, the matter has to do with one being elected to either the State House or National Assembly. National Assembly. It's, it's election, is it? <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Uh, they, that, Please like explain. I, like, like I said, it's not the issue is not ripe yet to that level. Yes. What you have is an academic question, whether um, at the moment it's a debate um, amongst the parties debating whether dual candidacy is permissible at all or not. Um, the jurisdiction question would arise if one of the parties is nominated to go to the National Assembly and become to take over the office of the president. Um, and, or to be elected into the office of the president, the, then if they, they will possibly have to be an objection that says you can't do right. that. Then that issue would arise. At the moment, it can, what the question that was before court is simply that give us a legal opinion. He says I'm not going to give it because I'm precluded to do so yes. by law. 
And then uh, the, the question is, they says, you know, you are entitled to give us because you are acting unreasonably and unfairly, which is your, what we call a constitutional Article 18 provision um, that requires administrative bodies such as ECN to act fairly and reasonably. Yes. So that 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 have nothing to do with any election. There is no electoral issue that is pending in that respect. Um, the electoral issue would only arise after maybe that question is resolved. Um, but, but, but is it? But it does not stop. Uh, <laughs> they, it does not thin... stop the EC. Yes. It does not stop. I stop IPC to yes. go to the High Court at all. Yes. But but, but there is rather maybe a thin line yeah. in determining what would qualify as an electoral matter and versus one that is maybe directly but but mm. because what if ipc is of the view that we need to get the house in order even before we arrive at that junction um the, the question if it's a it's a serious a question that is of a general public importance um, um i i don't see anything there are there are uh, constitutional mechanism um, that would require somebody to ask that question. And as those questions is the Attorney General approaching the court, if it's really a contentious issue of great public importance, yes. um, i.e. the Attorney General approaching the court directly to answer that question by way of a petition and seek for, for that determination, if it's really a party that is it's, it's a question that is ripe and uh, the parties are very contentious to it. That yes. would be the easiest... Uh, a way one would have to follow, yes. easy. Yes. That's one of them. Mr. Nanarapo, what, what yes. is your view? Yes. Um, uh, Daniel, uh, I look at that judgment, and uh, what the court says is that if one has to look at the Electoral Act, yes. so there is no definition of an electoral issue, but, uh, they, so, but they also look at the preamble of the Act and some of the definition of what an election is, but then so they say on the, on the uh, interpretation of the whole scheme of the, of, of the Act, so they could not find what the IPC is looking for as to be an electoral issue. Right. Uh, it simply not by using, you know, whatever interpretation is, is there or whatever definition is in that particular act. Yes. But, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's on that basis that, uh, you know, it's they, they have uh, not even go as far as determining if it's an electoral issue or not. Right. Yeah. But so they simply say, we, as the Electoral Act, um, before this matter, uh, we don't have any power to hear it because it hasn't, it's not covered by the, uh, by, by the Act that regulates the election matters. Right. Yeah. You're watching the wheels of justice here on NBC One. Our telephone lines are still open for your question or contribution. The number in the studio is 061-291-3339-291-3339. Advocate, um, perhaps help us understand the details enshrined in Article 18 of our Constitution. Mm. Um, uh, Article 18, it's, 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 an, uh, it's a provision that gives a right to every Namibian to um, just uh, and fair administrative action. Yes. Um, it imposes an obligation on administrative officials um, and institutions um, to act fairly and reasonably. And it also gives a right to those that are affected by the decisions of those administrative officials when they did not act fair and reasonably in according to them to approach any competent court um, to, uh, for whatever relief they seek uh, mm. or complain that they have and the order that they want the court to, to assist them with. Yes. Um, in a national, when you talk about reasonableness, you and 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 you are you are dealing with the issues of of, of um, both on the substance of the decisions itself, and it also you also dwell into reasonableness in the procedure that was adopted by a functionary um, in arriving at this decision. So as the fairness question, um, it also you also dealing with the fairness in the decision making it process itself or the decision itself. Let's say, for example, a decision is made without you being heard. Mm. That's what we talk about. It's unfair. You will not be able to reach a, a, a fair and reasonable decision if you don't hear my version of a story on whatever issue or list or 
dispute between the parties. That is really the, in a nutshell, the broader context which, within which you can define what Article 18 means. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a right that is given to every person to a fair and just administrative action, and reasonable yes. administrative yes. action. That's the correct wording of the, the provision, yeah. Yes. Mr. Nanapo, uh, yes. your view on Article 18. Perhaps let's look at how it could apply to the case of IPC versus uh, the Electoral Commission of Namibia. Yes, I mean, that would make a difference if the merits were heard because uh, it's about a decision that was, that was made by an administrative board such as ECN. Right. Now, the question is, was that reasonable? Um, lo looking on the, on the application of that particular article, uh, uh, obviously, like we have said before, it's, it's a question of ripeness, but, but if, if they approach the court saying, oh, we, we are here, we are not happy with what the ECN has done. So we are entitled to a just and fair administrative process. And then, uh, so the court can decide on that particular aspect. I mean, it's, it's, it's an... It's, it's, it's still, it's, still not the court to which they went to. Yeah, of course not. No, <laughs> no, of course not. That the, course not. The, the, the interpretation of the section, that the article, it didn't that rest with the the High Court itself, yes. right. the original yes. uh, jurisdiction. Uh, it, just to add on to the point, yes, it could very well be that um, uh, you on your earlier question or the public interest questions that you arise. Um, you would find it that it's unreasonable to refuse to disclose or your decision is unreasonable in that sense. Uh, but that's an issue that must be determined uh, in, in that context. Yes. Um, I have no views on whether it's... it's, 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 it's Mr. Nekwa, you have to hold your thought. Let's yes, hear from you. Joshua from Valfish Bay. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. How are you? Fine, thank you. Your question or contribution, sir? Uh, I just want to thank the gentleman in the studio. Uh, Mr. Joshua, we can hardly hear you. Um, if you can just uh, speak a little bit up. Okay, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your contribution and input. Can you hear me? No, we are struggling to hear you. Uh, I hope now you can hear me. Be slightly better, yes. You can hear me, right? S slightly better, yes. L let's try. Oh. Okay. Uh, as initially I was saying, I would just love to thank the gentleman in the studio. I really at least try to clarify on the, on the dispute. I just wanted to find out again from Mr. Nanapo again, because he said initially there at the beginning, about the concealment uh, when you said the attorney general is his uh, decision to say or not to say that they can release why the dual candidacy is not uh, uh, that the dual candidacy cannot be Hello? M Mr. Joshua? Yeah? C c can, can you just uh, repeat your question again? It has something to do with the Attorney General, but we did not really get the gist of the question. Well, I think we've lost uh, Mr. Joshua there. Uh, I, I'm not so sure if, I, I, if we... I, I didn't get the question, sorry. I, I didn't get it all. I think it had something to do with, uh, with whether the Attorney General uh, solely has the power to, to uh, maybe waiver the, or the, privilege. the privilege. No, no, the, the Attorney General has no power to waiver the privilege. The privilege is that of the client. The only person who can waive a clear privilege is the client themselves, meaning the Electoral Commission of Namibia. The Attorney General renders advice to, to their client, and the clients they must do what they need to do with the question. That if, if that's a question that they right. ask. Right. Yeah. M Mr. Joshua, you can always call back and uh, uh, basically make, uh, again, your question clear so that uh, we can um, 
provide an answer to that. But for now, um, let's hear from another caller on the line. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, Mr. Dawson. Uh, yes. Your contribution uh, or question, sir? Mine is just a very short and simple question. Is How do you compare the dual candidacy with the separation of powers? How does it fit with the separation of powers? Your executive, your legislator, and your judiciary. So now you're going for executive as well as uh, 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 executive as well as legislator. So that's the dual citizenship which is in question. So how does it fit with the separation of powers? Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, it's quite an interesting question indeed. I'm, I've, I've not had sight of the papers. I, I also don't know how the separation of power is engaged in respect of, of that. And um, uh, I, uh, we're really just looking at what is in the judgment. In the judgment, there's not much in details on what is the basis on which uh, it is contended that um, a dual, what they call dual candidacy, uh, it's, a, it's a separation of power issue. Um, I, I'm not too sure about the, the, the conceptualization of uh, what you call a dual candidacy um, in the electoral system that we have as in Namibia, uh, where you have got um, a, 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 a party system where a person votes a, a political party for the National Assembly and you vote for uh, a presidential candidate with the, through a direct universal suffrage, meaning you vote directly a, a, a person. Mm. Um, I don't know how the issue of dual candidates would arise because uh, when you're talking about the elections, they, you don't vote for an individual person for those that are running for the members of the National Assembly. Mm. The, the way I see it, the issue of a list, it's an incidence of, the, uh, of, 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 of an administration to say um, there, are, there are these, but they said an electoral system where you must vote a party. Of course, the party cannot represent itself in, in the National Assembly. It's individuals, persons who are going to be on the party list to be caught in the National Assembly. They don't contest for the elections. Um, um, it's the, how I understand the electoral system. Mm. But I guess I, I'm speaking without the benefit of having sight of, of, of the papers that yeah. has been filed. Mr. Nanambo, Nanambo, uh, Nanambo yes. perhaps, uh, let's have uh, regard to what your opinion would be in that specific question. I mean, our um, electoral system is, is different from that of South Africa, for example, where, I mean, uh, a president is then elected in the National Assembly or in Parliament. Uh, ours is then voted directly, but then when you have the presidential election, and which you have two, two ballot boxes, mm. basically one for the president yes. and the other one for the National Assembly. Yes. Uh, then where Mr. Nanapo um, appears on a ballot paper, as a presidential candidate, the same Mr. Nanapo's name is also part of the list to the National Assembly. Yeah. Is that not where the, the issue of uh, separation of power perhaps stems from? Yeah, well, I'm not entirely sure because uh, I do not know what the practicality effect uh, that can have. But uh, on the, on the issue of the separation of, of, of powers, uh, yes. basically the three branches of state so must be separate. You, uh, you, know, you cannot have, for example, of course that, that is a question that um, someone has to bring before court and, yes. and, 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 and see if that has any uh, impact on the separation of powers. But uh, I will not imagine a situation whereby um, the president is at the same time also the a member, a, of, a member of parliament. Yes. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work in, in, in practicality, but also on the point of the branches of state, like the executive, legislature must be uh, separate. Um, uh, of course, it, it, it would be quite interesting if it can be uh, clarified. The, the application in that regard would mm. seek to determine perhaps uh, or to perhaps determine whether one should choose between either being contesting for presidency or 
in the list of or yeah. the list of, of of the national assembly isn't it yeah i i'm not sure the legality of it have to be tested certainly yes and and if there's such a provision that prohibits somebody not to be in both lists as you call it yes um then the constitutionality of it have to also be determined at that stage uh, but the way i see it uh, in the electoral act i'm not too sure whether there's any prohibition to it but I'm seeking without the benefit of any side of any papers or, or the basis on which it is contended because what we have is a judgment, but the judgment did not go that far. It only deals with the issue of the jurisdiction, but it does not go into the arguments on the submissions on, on, which, on what basis it, contends, it, it is contended that um, a separation of power is engaged. Yes. Let's perhaps uh, have regard back to the application that we are... We, uh, discussing about today yes. and the court uh, made no order as to cost yes. perhaps uh, help us understand why the court uh, did not have regard to cost yes uh, the cost is an issue that is uh, always in the court's discretion uh, obviously the uh, the cost uh, follow the event in, in, in most cases the party who is successful is awarded the cost but in this particular case if I need to look at the Electoral Act also, it says, uh, so the cost can only be awarded in certain circumstances if the parties are acting vexatiously or frivolously. Mm -hmm. So, but then um, on the pleadings as they stand, so there was no such, uh, um, so there was no order made to the cost and, and that's what the court have, have, have basically said. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, you are still following the wheels of justice here on NBC One. When we return, we are going to look at our customary jargon of the day. Well, come back and let's now have regard to our jargon of the day. Well, Advocate Nekwaya, please explain what the doctrine of separa separation of power is. I mean, it was one of the questions by our caller. Yes, um, basically, the, uh, the doctrine of separation of power is an incident of the, of the Constitution and the rule of law, um, which then um, de demarcates the functions and powers between the three branches of the state. Um, and also deal with the checks and balances um, which is given to both. That is, the legislature's primary function is to make laws, um, the executive um, to make uh, these executive decisions and also um, for the courts to um, interpret the constitution and the law and give recourse to those that are affected by any decisions either of the, uh, or to check the decisions of the executive or those of, of uh, uh, parliament. Um, so, of course, um, it, it, the, the rule is that nobody should encroach on the other. Court must not make law. Um, that's a primary function of parliament. They must not legislate from the They must the not bench. legislate from the bench. <laughs> right. That's a primary function of parliament. Um, so as uh, parliaments must not make laws that are contrary to the constitution that violates the provisions of the constitution. So when the executive make their decisions, they must not make decisions that affect, um, uh, of course they affect people, but they must be legal and um, authorized either by the statutes or the laws from which they administer or the constitution itself. So it really regulates the interplay between those institutions and how they must conduct themselves. But there is nobody who is beyond the Constitution. The Constitution is the supreme, and everybody must conduct themselves within the constitutional realms. And otherwise, when there is a conflict between the law and uh, the perhaps execution of certain action, then the court should still interpret. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, of course, uh, um, Mr. Nanapo, yes. explain in simple terms what jurisdiction is. Jurisdiction. Um, basically, that means that uh, it's the power of that particular court to hear that matter. If one has to look at uh, different laws, they have, um, uh, you find some laws that are specifically says, if you have this particular matter, this is the right court that you must approach. And to give an example, for example, if you have a labor dispute, it tells you you must go to the labor commissioner's office. So 
when the law is enacted, it is enacted in a, in a way that there are, there are special tribunals and, and courts which have the special power to hear that particular matter. So you as a party that wants to approach the court, you cannot go to, to any court that you want. You have to look at what are the effects of your particular case and whether my course of action, which is this case of mine, can I approach this particular court? So it's very important that you have to first assess and evaluate what your effects are. And you have to also assert in yourself and try to acquaint yourself with what different type of laws says about different type of courts. In this particular case, for example, if, if it's an electoral court, so is your matter an electoral matter? If, it, if it's not, so the court will say, you have knocked on the wrong door, please, we cannot hear you. So it's basically the power of that particular court to hear that particular matter. And there are a variety of tribunals and courts. Some were, were actually enacted, not some, all of them were enacted by the act of parliament that tells you specifically this is the type of court that you must go for this particular matter. Okay. Am, am I, will I be correct if I say that that is now jurisdiction in terms of the subject matter? Yes. But, but they can also be jurisdiction in, in, in respect of location, isn't it? Uh, maybe let's, let's explain yeah, it, that. It could be the competency of court, yes. They, there will be, for example, some matters, magistrates court have got jurisdiction in respect of subject matter, location, and um, the monetary of bound. Um, you cannot go to, you can come to the magistrate's court, but you can't come for a certain threshold of an amount of money. You can get that from the high court. That's mm -hmm. again jurisdiction question. Uh, it's simply the competency of a court to determine the issue. The original, the original jurisdiction will always lie with the, lies with the high court as the inherent jurisdiction, which have got the competency to do anything not prohibited by law. So, so that's, that is really the, if, you, if all else fails, then you must go to the high court. Mm. In, in, in a criminal proceeding, um, if um, one is arrested in Rundu, um, they are also then expected to appear before the magistrate court of Rundu or the nearest, yes. and not Valfish Bay. Maybe is that also jurisdiction? And, and maybe let, let's just explain maybe the rationale behind that. Yeah, it, it, it is because you know, it confines you to the geographical area in which the crime was committed. Um, that particular court must have the competency to hear your particular matter than the other court, although any, uh, although any other court can do that, so, but, they, but there is a geographical you know, um, kind of setup and say, if this particular matter emanates from this particular geographical region, it must be heard there. However, um, you know, it depends also uh, on the magnitude of that particular matter. There are, there are times even when that particular matter is committed within that particular jurisdiction, it, it, it cannot be heard there and then must go to the high court. Yes. Well, uh, advocate, uh, perhaps any final remarks, any final submission? <laughs> no, 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 no final submission. Thank you very much. Um, it's good to, uh, to, for having us. Yes. Um, it's uh, quite a very, like I said, a very live issue still. Uh, I don't see that it has, it has, it's dead by virtue of the high court or the electoral court decision. Right. The party may pick it up to go to the high court, but it may also arise in the context that I stated earlier in my, they, my they, discussion. They could basically wait, wait for uh, the nomination for the period. nomination period and then take it. And then take it to whatever forum. Yes. Yes. Any final submission? Yes. Um, obviously, this is an interesting case. I mean, it's an election year. Now, these are the issues that uh, need to be resolved as, as soon as, po as possible. Uh, I think the most important is, is that um, um, evaluate what the real issue is in that particular instance and make sure that you are before the right court so that uh, you, you, you get your dispute or your facts resolved. Because right now, as we stand now, what we have is a situation where you are told, we cannot hear you. So what you want to be heard was not really heard. So yes. you still have that, and you, you want it to be uh, resolved. Uh, things are the best way is just to approach so the right court for that dispute to, to be resolved. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, of course, the subject matter today has to do with election. Um, 
I don't mean to put you on the spotlight, but uh, did you register? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did register. I was the, on the first day of the uh, registration process, so R I, I right. registered. Right. Yes. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> I'm going to register right on the last day. <laughs> Why is that so? Perhaps, perhaps uh, this could also be an opportunity for you to encourage member of, uh, members of the public yeah, yes, uh, to yes. go out uh, there in numbers and, and register. Indeed. Yes. Why do you think it's also the right thing to do? It is very important because um, that's the only way that you can participate in, in, in your right to anything that is content in the Constitution. You have to choose the person that is going to lead you, the person that is going to you know, um, uh, lead your, your life. I mean, participatory democracy includes elections, and that is the process which uh, the government is chosen. Yes. It's quite important. Yes. Uh, advocate. Yes, indeed, um, it, it's, it's your right to choose. It's your right to have a say yes. in the democratic governance of our country, of our country and architecture. So it's, it's just right that you must register to vote. Um, it doesn't help to leave the responsibility to your mother, your father, or your grandmother, uh, because that responsibility, it's a primary right that you have under the Constitution. It lies with you, nobody else. Mm. How, how does it affect an individual if they decide to uh, abstain? Um, you, you, would, you, would, you would have a leader that you have not elected. Yes. You may probably disagree with their views and policies that they, they promise they are going to articulate. Whereas you leave out, um, there is somebody who have got policies and ideologies that you think would advance your country, your democratic architecture. So it's, 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 it's right that you must exercise that right. Mm. It, it's, yeah. it's quite very important. Right. I mean, if you waived your right, um, it means you, you are not exercising it when you have an opportunity. It's like if you are granted, if you are granted an opportunity to do something and you don't do it, yes. now, you know you are living in this particular uh, country, so it would be now difficult for you to have a say in whatever is to, is to be done because it, eventually you are not doing anything good to yourself. Mm. So you are letting it out in the hands of other people which might not have the voice and the thoughts like you have. So it's, it's quite important that you have to participate so that you know you have actually done your part as far as um, choosing the people that you want to lead is concerned. Gentlemen, thank you so much for making time for the Wheels of Justice, uh, for sharing your expertise, and of course, thank you for the manner in which you executed your mandate here okay. on the Wheels of Justice. Thank you very much. You so I much. think this paves uh, the way for more <laughs> engagements. <laughs> yes, I mean, we, you're welcome to, to invite us for any, and I'm glad I was invited for today's panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Fellow Namibians, be reminded that the general registration of voters ends on the 1st of August this year. For all eligible Namibians, as we prepare for Wednesday, the 27th of November 2024, being the polling day. However, as far as the wheels of justice is concerned, we have come to the end of our proceedings for this particular evening. I'm Daniel Nadunya, and this session stands adjourned. Thank you.